the latest tech. I'm Alexa. I can answer your questions. Interviews. And we are evolving and we are seeing an amazing opportunity that's happening. Accessibility. Accessibility is, is one of our core values. It's even a part of our mission statement. This is Double Tap TV. Welcome back to Double Tap TV, where we bring you all the latest in tech from an accessibility point of view. Last week, we brought you a really amazing conversation with two unique individuals in the music creation space. And this week, both of them are back as we bring the conversation kind of to the present day and talk about the industry as it stands today. I am Marco Flalo with Stephen Scott by my side each and every single week. Stephen, what have you learned so far from these guys? Because this was a long conversation. Well, yeah, I mean, I learned a lot because I'm not in the music business. Uh, who'd have known eh, that I'm not in the music business? I'm not a music superstar, Mark. Uh, it may be shocking to learn that. But, uh, you know, what I did learn was that the capability uh, to learn music and play music and make music uh, you know, it started very early. And for someone like Stevie Wonder, I guess I thought like a lot of people that he probably would, would just have a lot of people around him that would do a lot of this for him. He would come up with the ideas and they would make it into a reality. And that obviously wasn't good enough for Rob Arbatier, who we spoke to and we will continue to speak to today. He wanted Stevie to have some control over that. And I, I just think that story in itself is incredible. You know, we talk a lot about how especially these days, how disabled people need to push themselves further forward. We need to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and, you know, do more ourselves. And that's all great and wonderful. But isn't it wonderful when someone comes along and says, actually, I can help you with this. I know this technology. I know how to make this do whatever you need it to do. So I'll help you do that and turn up a hotel room in New York and say, please buy this or I'm, you know, going to be sleeping on the streets tonight, which I just <laughs> still think is an amazing story. Um, and so brave of Rob to go and do that. And he did. And, well, you know, Stevie loved it. And, you know, the greatest part of that story was by the end of that tour, uh, back then in the late 80s, they were using the very computer that he had uh, taken to that hotel that night onto stage to work on. And that proved that for Stevie, how capable it, w it, it was for him to be able to use. Uh, just a, an incredible story. I learned a lot about it, and I imagine we'll learn a lot more today. Yeah, there's a lot of parallels, I think, that go, even if you're not into music creation, Stephen, you know, just in audio production, which you and I both do on a daily basis, there are so many parallels between those two, you know, genres. Because editing music and producing music is very similar to just editing spoken word. Of course, there are many, many differences that people will argue with me about, and I totally get that. But in terms of the tools that existed, Back then, people were recording audio to tape. It was reel to reel. It was eight track. It was four track. It was two track. There was no digital audio workstations. There were no computers that were recording the audio. At the end of the day, it still ended up on an analog tape. So the idea of bringing a computer into the mix that really did more than just what a keyboard might have been capable on the MIDI side of things. Bringing a computer in to make things easy um, really was kind of far-fetched almost at that point in time. Yeah, but I actually think in some ways that introduced the problem to people like Stevie Wonder because all of the tactile technology of the time, everything was, it was all tactile. And, you know, if you wanted to change a knob on a processor, you would just go up to the processor, find the knob and change it. And, you know, Stevie could label that. And, you know, lots of us who grew up in the radio industry did that all the time. I used to label the mixing desks I worked in in the radio studios, uh, you know, much to the hatred of everybody else. You'd say, what are these stupid dots meaning? And I'd be like, well, that's for me, so I know what that is or what that does. And, and that was, we got round it that way. But when computers came in, the accessibility became more of a challenge because you couldn't just go up to something and physically change it. You had to know how to manipulate it in the software, usually with a mouse and keyboard. And what Rob did was be able to break that barrier down for Stevie. And it really did obviously make the difference for him. And it actually probably laid the groundwork for a lot of companies, music production companies especially, to be able to build that kind of ability into their software. You know, one of the things that Rob told us behind the scenes um, was that, you know, he he wasn't, you know, blind. He was there was no visual impairment on his side. So there was a big learning curve for him as well to understand how is Stevie going to use this and adapt it in real time while they were on that tour. Every single day there were constant updates. They were tweaking it until, you know, the version that we see today, which he says, you know, is still being used and still being updated every couple of years. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, that I, I love the idea of the software updates coming you know, almost as fast as Apple's updates these days or uh, or Microsoft updates, you know, but he was writing them at the moment. He was just writing them there and then. 
And, you know, I think that's great. And I just, I love the passion in what Rob talked about. Uh, you know, and Ed has a great story to tell as well. And, you know, maybe I'll, I'll put that point earlier. I mentioned this about, you know, using old tech versus new tech. And in some ways, maybe the older tech made it easier for people. I'll maybe put that question to Ed Gray later. He's been in the business a while. Uh, maybe I should ask him about whether or not that's something that, that applies in his thinking or whether actually today's technology is more accessible. I mean, I think it depends on the individual. I think it depends on your background, right? If you've always grown up using that tactile way, cutting physical tape, putting stuff together that way, yeah, that's the world you're used to. A computer could actually disable you. But if you've grown up today or you are growing up today and you're visually impaired and you're going into the music industry, the tools are all out there. You know, I mean, the base level, I guess, is what is it, Garage Band on on the um, Mac? Yeah. In fact, on iPad as well. Audacity on a PC, it's free. You know, uh, yeah, exactly. There are That's tools right. Out there. The, the roots are all there. Yeah. So if you guys are just tuning in and you're wondering what on earth are these guys talking about, well, you should go back to our episode from last week because we've been talking about music creation and we've got two incredible guests who are joining us again this week. Uh, so let's take a quick break. We're going to come back and reintroduce Ed Gray and Rob Barbert here, here on Double Tap TV. And again, if you guys want to get involved, feedback at ami.ca is the email address and make sure you're following us on Twitter at Double Tap Canada and use the hashtag Ask Double Tap so we can get to your questions a lot quicker. We come back with our two guests in a moment. For more great Double Tap TV content, visit ami.ca slash Double Tap. This is Double Tap TV. We are back on Double Tap TV talking all things music creation and how things have changed from the yesteryear to today. Mark Aflalo with Stephen Scott by my side and our guests this week joining us once again Ed Gray is a director of partner programs and accessibility at Avid, the makers of Pro Tools and Media Composer. And Rob Arbiter is a Grammy Award winning engineer. He's a producer, he's a musician, and he's a music technologist. And both of these guys are welcome back to Double Tap TV. Rob, let's, let's get to you for a second here. Do you get credit for the work that you've done, whether it's with Stevie or whether it's behind the scenes? Um, in the industry, they do, just because I've been doing it for so long. I've never, like all the stuff I've developed for Stevie, I developed just for him. And then we've we've at times shared the technology. Like we used to give everything to Ray Charles too. And I used to let, spend a lot of time uh, with him. People didn't realize that because he was older, but Ray Charles was actually a really technical guy and he was way into uh, all this whiz bang stuff. And, and Stevie used to, whatever I built for Stevie, we would often give a version of it to Ray and Diane Shore, we shared some technology with and, and different blind users. but. Yeah, I mean, I was always known, my career was always very sheltered just with Stevie until I branched out to people I met through Stevie, like Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston and Diana Ross and all these other people I met through him. But mm -hmm. um, but I was known in the industry as someone who was doing blind development because there just weren't a lot of people doing it. And the manufacturers all knew me because I was driving them crazy to try to make their stuff more accessible. Ed, earlier we were talking about, you know, uh, you know, old versus new tech which is better and i wanted to get your take on this as we get more into the world of touchscreen devices software controlled even app controlled kit do you ever long for the days of the the tactile sounding boards and, and physical knobs and, and buttons yeah there's a, um uh, sheila O'Moran. she's a professor uh, at uh university of michigan she is blind and she she articulates this super well we should have her on a show but uh, she was um, she was cutting tape and splicing it for the BBC and had a great career and she lost her eyesight and, but th and things were going okay because she worked with knobs and and uh, scissors and tape and and then um, everything uh, became electronic and all of, all of a sudden she was locked out of it so she experienced exactly what you're talking about things were on flat panels and um, and on computers and there were no tools for her to adapt to it. And she was uh, she was uh, kind of kind of um, wandering for a while, and she was part of uh, she's part of uh, efforts to make haptic surfaces and uh, things like that. So you know, guys, technology evolves so quickly and has evolved so quickly since those early days that you're talking about. You know, I used to program and develop apps and software using Visual Studio back in the Windows 3.1 days, but my career took me in a in a very different path. 
What, and what happened there was I wasn't even able to keep up with the constant changes in technology. And, you know, five years later, you, you kind of lose it. So how are you guys keeping up? How are, how are you, Rob, able to keep up with the changes in technology and adapt to what's going on? Yeah, um, we keep up with it and I keep up with it. On, on top of the music stuff I've done, I am also involved with several startups and I'm running three different companies right now. So, and they're all technology based. So I personally stay up on everything. But what I've done with, with Stevie and what makes sense for most people, also it's a budgetary consideration for most people, you don't try to ride the wave continuously. Like you let the wave happen, you try to stay up on it, but it's only every few years that we actually do it. And we're actually talking about doing one now because it's been a few years. But the technology is gonna evolve continually and it's never gonna stop. But you can drive yourself crazy if all you try to do is ride that wave. The trick is- Yeah, that's a very good advice. Build something that's working, keep it working and reliable for a while. Keep an eye on what's coming next and you can plan what the next system is gonna be. But like with Stevie, we don't do a major revamp more than every three or four years because otherwise you would just spend your whole life chasing new technology. And at some point you gotta worry about the creativity. Your audience doesn't care what tools you use or how long it took you to do your album. They just care that they love it. So don't don't get sucked into thinking you have to constantly be on the edge. Um, if you're doing it with a company, it's and you know you're trying to appeal to a large audience, and it's um, you, you it's it's a different calculus, right? You you're doing something that appeals not to some uh, like a super genius with an unlimited money supply who can you know you know whatever you know whatever he wants. You try to deliver it. You you have to have something that meets the sweet spot of a large population of customers. And you have to have someone who's like a chief technology officer type who can look at the corner around the corner at trends and make sure that you're adopting the right systems and uh, technologies. An example of that is, is our website. So our website at Avid uh, used to be just invisible to blind users. It's just a bunch of stuff was just opaque. And now it's, it's much better I think I'm playing inside baseball saying that it still needs a lot of improvements. And so we're working hard on them, but websites um, in order to like, to uh, be an acceptable, acceptable website these days, I sound like an old man, like, you know, these days in order for the, you know, back when I was a kid, I walked five miles to build a website. Um, but, but you, you, you know, you have to take advantage of Java and, and Aria and do all these things where, you know, things are transparent and they fold out and you're exposed to the thing underneath and it's all three dimensional. So that's something that this, this overlay of this new, new, new types of development to make your website look even accessible among the bath of websites and not look rudimentary. Um, it, that's an example of like an, uh, an evolving technology where you, you have to make decisions based on your resources to, to stay on top of it. You know, when I used Pro Tools, I, I knew the common and most important thread was never update your computer. If there was an operating system update to Mac OS, do not wait until you get confirmation from the company, in this case, Avid, or when it was back in the day, it was DigiDesign. Once you found out that all your plugins were gonna work and the hardware was gonna work, then you hit that update button. How That's important still today, right? That is the number one cardinal mistake people make. Just wait till the technology, unless, you don't really care about not being able to be creative anymore. Yeah. <laughs> the technology is not ever what's stopping you from being creative. And if you're blaming the technology, you're, you're not looking at the process yeah. correctly. Yeah. Um, I will say this, what this conversation, and I've known it forever, but this conversation is really clarified for me. You know, I'm at the consumer end of all this stuff. And so I get to decide, you know, when do we upgrade? Is it worth it? Is it not worth it? And Ed's job is to continually feed us the reasons to wonder, is it time to upgrade? Is it not? And, so we're, we're kind of on the same mission here, but at opposite ends of it. Okay, guys, we've got one more segment with you guys, so please do stick around. Thank you so much for being here. I am Mark Aflalo with Stephen Scott. This is Double Tap TV. We take a quick break and come back and unfortunately wrap things up with Rob and Ed. For more great Double Tap TV content, visit ami.ca slash double tap. This is Double Tap TV. 
Let's get back to the conversation. And honestly, this could have gone for four more shows. But alas, all good things must come to an end. We are back here at Double Tap TV. Marco Flalo and Stephen Scott with you. Let's wrap things up with Ed Gray, Director of Partner Programs and Accessibility at Avid, the makers of Pro Tools and Media Composer, and Grammy Award-winning engineer, producer, musician, and music technologist Rob Arbitier. Guys, let me put this to both of you. What advice would you both give to people who might be musicians at the moment who may one day have to face the news that they might lose their vision? You know, what advice would you give to that person and give them some hope that, you know, if that were to happen, it's not all over? What I realized, especially in the earliest days with Stevie, is that anything that we would do that would make a system less, uh, require less visual interaction, made it better for sighted people too. So like yep. when, when Cubase added the M key to muted track, guess what? Everybody started using it. It's not like only blind people were using that. It, you know, it just made it better for everybody. And the best tools are the tools you don't have to look at that free you up to be creative. You know, as a classical pianist, I learned as a kid, you don't look at your hands while you're playing. You look at the music. It, the same is true. If you're working on music, you put your head in the space of creating the song, not looking at the tools. So the very best tools that are out there don't require a lot of visual interaction. And I realize that sets aside a lot of, you know, mouse-based things. But truth is, any tool that you can use from a keyboard and that you don't have to stare for a screen, stare at a screen, that frees you up to be creative. So what I would say to anybody, and I've, I've talked to a lot of people losing their vision. I have people in my family in that situation. The trick is identify the tools that are the best non-visual tools that you would use anyway, even if you weren't losing your vision. You know, I grab boards, but it doesn't require me to look at the screen. I like, I do everything with keyboard commands and I use the mouse as little as possible. So I'd say to a sighted person who's listening to the site, this is a gift that you have this site for a while even. Use it to experiment with the tools, figure out which ones require the least visual interaction and lean towards those. Because the truth is those tools are better for sighted people too. And you're just being forced to find them because you're losing your vision, but it doesn't mean they're still not the right tools for you to gravitate to. And that, that's what I say. The best, the best tools are non-visual anyway. Exhibit A, here's, here's, um, here's my iPhone speaking an email message. Trophies looks pretty cool and we covered the VI portion of the show. I would really like to get something like Easy Drummer in there as well as possible. What's the blocker with tune track at the moment? Would it help if I put it in so, um, um, voiceovers the, is the, the, the text to speech um, facility in, in iOS and Mac OS. And I guarantee you that being able to, to like speak the news and your email, even if you're perfectly sighted, it just makes you more productive. And as you heard, you're nothing, nothing this thing can do can speak faster than your brain works. So you can get through <laughs> a ton of material really quickly. Um, so, but, uh, my, my advice, and, and I've shared this with Mark, just based on my personal experience, losing my eyesight over a few years is um, that initially I tried to hold on for dear life to the standard ways to, um, to make the screen more visible. So I was enlarging text and reversing the colors on the screen and putting things in high contrast mode. And that worked for a while. And then it was like peeing on a brush fire, you know, it just didn't <laughs> help anymore. And, 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 um, um, I would work for a couple of hours and then I would have to take a rest. I would lie down and I would see the letters in the same fonts and the same color racing across my field of vision. I would see actual words. And that was because my brain wanted to do something with the parts of the brain that used to see. So that's, so, so again, not only did my eyes hurt, but my brain was on overload. And when I started to let go of that and use the, use the text to speech tools more and learn the commands and macros, I just felt so much better. And so, um, so as, as uh, you're losing your eyesight, you have to uh, discover uh, what tools are available and how to get them and, and uh, go to a clinic on how to use them. And if you thought that the blind community as a whole did this reliably, you'd be wrong. I think that, um, I think that, that many people in blind and disabled communities let these changes uh, uh, and, and innovations wash over them. They, and they're neither motivated nor, or they may not know how to reach out and take advantage of them. So you have to get a buddy or a friend or go to a support center, like a lighthouse. A lighthouse is a, is a, is a blind resource center that they have in most major cities and, and uh, learn the tools. And um, so it's a form of acceptance 
and it's a and it's a form of learning that some people are prepared to do and some aren't. But it'll 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 change everything. It'll make your it'll make it so that when you um, look at a PowerPoint presentation, you don't have a you know your 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 um, your heart is not in your stomach by the time you're done trying to read it. Uh, so so use the tools, and they're they're excellent on Mac OS and Windows. Windows, so Mac OS has voiceover. That's the built-in uh, uh, speaking tool. And um, that's, it's part of Mac OS. You get it, you don't have to like buy anything else and it's built in and improves every time. And then Windows has had narrator and that used to be pretty, uh, pretty simple, but it's gotten a lot better. So on both those OSs and on mobile OSs, there are tools to, to speak the text. I'm just gonna point out one other quick thing. Also, like Ed, through what he's been doing at Avid, he knows a ton of really, really talented blind users who are flying on the technology. And so there's nothing wrong with reaching out to a manufacturer and saying, look, I wanna become part of that community. I wanna meet these experts. Like the last time I was at the NAMM show with Eddie, he introduced me to all these people who are flying on Pro Tools without looking at it, you know, faster than a lot of the sighted users yep. I know. Become part of that community, reach out. These manufacturers are, are you know, they view you as a customer. And so you're important to them. And and you know, really get involved and you'll meet other people in the same boat. It may not be the biggest club in the world, but there are definitely other people going through what you're going through. Yeah. And that way the accessibility changes will be meaningful. And like I say, it won't be a bunch of empathetic sighted people um, prioritizing the features. They'll be based on real world recommendations and needs of blind and disabled users. Rob, Ed, thank you so much for taking the time to join us in these past two episodes. I hope you guys at home have learned a lot from these guys because uh, it's not often you're going to get two people of this caliber in a room like we just did on Double Tap TV. On behalf of Ed Gray, Rob Barbertier, and Stephen Scott, I am Mark Aflalo. Please do keep in touch. The email address is feedback at ami.ca. On Twitter, we are at Double Tap Canada with that hashtag, which is Ask Double Tap. And we will catch you again on our next episode of Double Tap TV. Hosted by Mark Aflalo and Stephen Scott. Editing Jordan Steves and Mark Aflalo. Voiceover Anna Vicino. Integrated Described Video Specialist Ron Rickford. Coordinating Producer Jennifer Johnson. Director Production Kara Nye. Director Programming Brian Perdue. VP Content Development and Programming John Melville. President and CEO David Arrington. Copyright 2021 Accessible Media Inc.